right, well, welcome everybody and those online to this very um, momentous occasion in the life of Sharon's IASIS thesis. Uh, she's ready to press the submit button. So uh, this is really the final hurdle, uh, but really important for Sharon, both in terms of getting her ideas together, but also in terms of your responses and thoughts. thoughts. Um, wholesale rewriting is not going to occur at this stage, uh, as I'm sure those of you who have been through the PhD journey understand. Uh, but Karen has uh, an amazing background, both working in the field of climate activism within Turkey and Europe more generally, and is currently with Climate Works uh, Senior Manager or Senior Research Project, Manager. Project Manager of the Southeast Asia Program. Um, her thesis is a case study of Turkey, and I'm not quite sure how to say it anymore, um, a resistance-led transition away from coal, the case of Turkey. So without further ado, Sharon will speak for about 30 minutes, may go a little bit longer, uh, and then plenty of time for questions and thoughts afterwards. So, so over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you for coming. coming. Welcome to my completion seminar. Today, I'll walk you through the key highlights my PhD is this potential of a just transition away from coal. Just adjust that just a little bit. Thanks, Jaren. Sure thing. Just to make sure that mine can hear. Right. All good? That's better. Thanks. Sorry about that. Hope it's you hear me better now. So, so my thesis explores the potential of a just transition away from coal, away from coal in a country without a coal industry. In part by the position, I will walk you through the opportunities and barriers for a resistance transition through a case study of Turkey. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulit Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be a virginal land. I also acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across and beyond Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures, and heritage, and recognize their continuing sovereignties. Before I commence with the official section, I need a minute to say a few words to the people I incur the depths in my PhD journey. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my principal supervisor, Fiona, and my co-supervisor, Joan, to the members of my advisory committee, Sangita and Nadim, to the amazing Climate and Energy College slash the Melbourne Climate Futures, which I feel lucky to call home, the criminology cohort, the SLAM team led by Sebastian, to my sisters back home and online, and in my new home, to my dear brother and mother, and last but not the least, my amazing husband, Noyan, and my son, Shayangin, for their support in my PhD journey. So now that the love letter section is over and I'm rest assured I don't get any tough questions at the end of the presentation, I can move forward with the official part. You can see the structure of my presentation in the slides. In the first 15 minutes, I'll talk about the rationale, the motivating problem, research gap, objective, my research questions, methodology, and context. And the remaining 20, 15 to 20 minutes, I'll talk about my thesis argument and the added value of my research plus in the transitions research. Um, to start with my trigger for my interest in exploring the unfolding transition phenomenon in Turkey was due to my encounter with a woman, let's call her Aisha, back in 2015. I met her during a protest against a new coal-fired power plant in a small rural district uh, called Yir Yirja in Soma. Uh, surrounded by tear gas, um, she was barricading the local police force, the gendarmerie, holding a bright green embroidered banner that read, Talanet Tirmijas, we're not allowing the pillage. Uh, I still remember how I felt all at once. I was uh, out of my comfort zone, uh, confused and inspired altogether. This template banner write, written climate justice right. now that we have probably translated in our fancy office in Istanbul from a, a European NGO did not feel right. Her handmade banner uh, had something different. It was not about the policies. It was not about the market interventions. It was not about our consumer choices uh, or about our community-based solutions on top of our roofs. Her banner was about a harm a new coal mine uh, would inflict upon her life, her village, and her children. Coal men settling in a larger town where she could buy a small flat with the money that the company would provide in exchange for her home, her farm, her lifestyle, her father's cemetery, and her past. 
It meant handing her son his lunchbox and keeping an eye on the local news for any potential accidents in the mine that day. Which brings me to the dilemma she's dealing with as an interviewer uh, brilliantly summarized as um, trapped between choosing bread or breast. So bread refers to her primary income, uh, while bread stands for uh, right to live in a healthy environment. By being trapped, the interviewee refers to Aisha having to choose between the deprivation of her primary income by the ceasing of agricultural production and living in uh, decent health conditions. In this case, migration, uh, migrating from her village uh, to prevent health harms. If the coal project materializes, if the plant fails to go ahead, she doesn't need to choose between her bread and bread. Her uh, traditional income generation can enter, her, the air quality level can stay as is. Uh, let's park it here for a moment and look at how this fits to the narrative of transitioning away from coal and the justice uh, implications of it, and then I'll come back to Aisha. But today, many countries acknowledge the need, the need to phase out uh, coal as the prerequisite for staying uh, within planetary boundaries since coal production and consumption is the chief uh, barrier to curbing carbon emissions. Uh, this globally endorsed mandate has become a central mitigation uh, strategy in many parts of the world, especially following the landmark uh, Paris Agreement back in 2015 and the promising Glasgow Pact a few years later. So we can say there's a political mandate to strengthen the case on sign call to history. Consequently, the idea of minimizing the socioeconomic disruptions of climate action is also recognized in uh, many countries for this effort. Governments employ just transition mechanisms to provide quality jobs to coal workers, to diversify the regions which are dependent on coal, and support uh, the coal companies for their potential uh, financial losses. Paradoxical to the high level endorsement from many industrialized and some industrializing countries, many industrializing ones are also planning a resurgence on coal. 27 countries, including my case study, Turkey, along with Pakistan, Philippines, Bangladesh, Mexico, Egypt plan 108 gigawatt of new coal fire power plants. This capacity is roughly uh, four times the coal plants operating in Australia. Despite the political impetus though, the coal investments are not being deployed at the scale or pace that it's projected. Many new plant and mine projects have been canceled, um, precisely 1,751 gigawatt in the last decade. To put this again in context, this amount is approximately 76 times of the installed capacity of coal in Australia. How can we then explain this apparent disruption in the transition towards coal, and how does this trend inform us of the possibility of a just transition away? On the one hand, a transition away from coal is required before we even start thinking about the repercussions that are, are not wretched for anyone. On the other hand, the mandate to increase coal use is not materializing, despite the pot uh, strong political will and the financial incentives that governments in many of these industrializing countries provide. Uh, Turkey is an interesting country to test this idea, I believe. Its planned capital investment in the coal sector is the sixth largest in the world. And while a um, state or a market-led transition is not in sight, uh, the realization rate of these new uh, coal projects remains surprisingly low. In the last decade, a significant number of uh, new plants have been delayed or uh, prevented, 76 gigawatt in the last decade, equivalent to the total installed capacity of the country. So my thesis explores whether and how this disruption in the trajectory towards coal can improve the long-standing structural injustices that the workers in the coal sector and the communities in coal-reliant uh, regions experience. So let me come back to where I parked earlier and tease out how the consideration of the context, motive, means and actor presents in my, uh, that are present in my thesis are different from and relevant to those uh, in the just transition uh, research and policy making and how this difference then helps me extend the idea of a just transition. Uh, let me present another fictional character uh, to get a sense of the stereotypical emphasis represented in uh, sustainability transitions research. Let's call him Hans. So you will see Hans's concern on the left and Aisha's concerns on the right. Hans's concern is shaped by a coal phase-out mandate with Germany uh, aiming to achieve a coal moratorium by 2030 and it's called uh, exit strategy, a part of a national energy vendor. Uh, agenda that aims to have 80% of the share of gross electricity consumption supplied from renewables by 2050. By contrast, coal is uh, not yet history in Aisha's village. It's rather fueling her future and her context being shaped by an uh, increase in uh, coal in the power mix. Uh, second, the actor. 
The hunts, uh, the predominant actors in the events occurring in Yirja and Ruhr Valley are also quite different. Hans is an economically well-off miner in the Zolverin mine in Ruhr Valley and a member of a Rehenish Westphalian coal syndicate, the um, politically influential trade union. As such, Hans has a desirable job, a job security connection with a close-knit network of miners, enjoying the hard-won benefits uh, such as uh, retirement plans or right to uh, union representation. Aisha, on the other hand, represents the marginalized rural communities uh, that rely on traditional income generation as a disenfranchised subsistence farmer. Third, the motive. So Hans' motive is to continue his economic and social well-being after the mine shuts down, whereas Aisha wants to stop the coal project in order to uh, continue her livelihood in a sector other than coal. Uh, finally, the means. So Hans's context is shaped by a state-led transition in which the government come to an agreement with the affected workers, with the unions and communities, and compensate for their losses as part of the regional uh, transition management plan. And evidently, these central conditions are uh, lacking in Aisha's village. And her reaction to the social environmental change is to fight against the local police uh, amidst the tear gas together with some powerful allies. So teasing out um, Aisha's struggle to protect her olive trees in achieving favorable, favorable outcomes in terms of both climate action and social justice, hints that these land-based struggles can potentially extend the way we understand what is just and whose justice we take into account within the principles championed by the idea of a just transition. It also hints that the community dissent can be an alternative mean for communities to achieve a just transition in countries where the state market configurations are not uh, front and center. So the central research question that guide my thesis is, uh, can a just transition unfold in Turkey? And if so, how? And I break down my central research question into three fundamental ones. My first one aims to uh, explore the opportunities and barriers that drive a coal transition agenda. I explore what coal dependency looks like in a particular place, who's winning in the system, and under what conditions they're uh, winning. Following this endeavor to understand the political economy of coal, uh, I explore who's bearing the burdens of uh, the coal dependent system, in what ways they are experiencing these, and how those vulnerables are related to those that are potentially arising from a transition away from. And finally, I explore the opportunities for land-based struggles to contribute to accelerating a transition away from coal and the, their tensions with other vulnerable communities who experience the justices that are reinforced uh, by coal investments. So cautious of time, I will uh, briefly say a few words about the methodology and just uh, mention why my thesis uh, adopts a qualitative instrumental single case study approach uh, that is informed by stake. So a qualitative approach enables me to closely examine uh, the phenomena through a detailed contextual analysis. Uh, thanks to an instrumental case study, I gain insight into a particular issue, which then helps me make sense of a wider uh, phenomena, that is whether and how a just transition can unfold in countries without a full phase out trajectory. And I explore this relationship through a single case study because the complexity of what is being studied suggest more can be learned from a detailed uh, exploration of this phenomena than by surveying a representative uh, sample. Um, so I don't have time for a deep dive of this literature review chapter, but I want to highlight two points in, uh, with regard to the political nature of coal reliance and the political nature of uh, coal transitions. Um, the first one is that coal is not only a resource for generating electricity. It's embedded in the institutions and ideologies of how economies and societies operate. And it's a commodity that was central to the uh, emergence of industrialism and the most dominant political uh, regime uh, in the last century, liberalism. And the second point is that the future is of coal is also bound up in politics. So reducing our reliance on coal is underpinned by several technical, uh, social, economic, and political uh, elements, technical ones such as the abundance of coal reserves or social factors such as the size of and the structure of the uh, workforce, the history of social movements, or the capacity for a communal form of engagement with the uh, power of markets. Economic aspects such as the added value of coal imports into the economy, or uh, more specifically for my uh, thesis, the political considerations, such as how it legitimizes the existing region, how the market is organized, and uh, how the power assets are owned. Uh, this chapter in my thesis is inspired by the article we published in Environmental Research Letters, in which we looked at the political drivers of historical coal phase-out experiences around the world. And we have another 
um, article part two of um, this work, which will hopefully be published uh, later this year. Uh, now I will uh, move forward with the analytical framework. So the conceptual framework, I used to make sense of the transition phenomena unfolding in my case study, uh, the resistance led transition, is informed by the theoretical and uh, underpinnings of environmentalism of the poor. This contribution to the political ecology, first by John Martinez Elier, and then later elaborated by many political uh, economists, such as Leah Temper, is grounded in the stewardship of agrarian communities. In attempts to safeguard their livelihood, the response to the disruptions of their traditional uh, income generating methods. And at this point of the presentation, I'll say a few words about how Turkey has tied its political trajectory based on a vision that currently stabilizes the coal region and what are the opportunities and barriers for a transition away from coal based on that. I think this quote that an interview we again put forward neatly summarizes the findings of this empirical chapter. The continuation of the presidential system comes before everything else, meaning the key drivers in maintaining investment in coal infrastructure and constraining the acceleration of the transition to non-fossil fuel technologies are in fact primarily political. I unpack how the coal trajectory provides ways for political controls uh, to be maintained in this slide. The goal of ensuring a favorable operating environment for the business incumbents and maximizing job security exclusively for the blue collar workers and minimizing the public resistance to the social and environmental impacts of coal currently outweigh considerations in relation to the viability and profitability of phasing out coal. Hence, the underlying objectives of this tra trajectory is primarily based on maintaining uh, the political control. And these uh, pressures uh, currently override factors such as uh, with greater potential to steer the government towards a uh, decarbonization agenda. However, the coal rush also meets with attention. So contrary to the political will to increase the share of coal, the government and the incumbent coal companies increasingly confronted with a series of contradictory uh, trends. We publish these arguments as a book chapter on the political economy of coal uh, by Rutledge Press, along with other 15 uh, countries, and these findings also contribute to the commentary article that's published in Nature. Uh, after presenting the context, I will uh, continue with this thesis argument for the remainder of the presentation. So the central argument of my thesis is that a just transition away from coal is possible in countries without a coal phase out agenda. I'll now unpack this uh, central argument into three main components. The first research finding is that protests of uh, locally affected resource users grounded in the injustices reinforced by coal is a promising potential factor in spurring a transition away from In other words, complementary to the policies, market dynamics, and technological innovations that are frequently asserted in sustainability transitions research, Aisha's dissent contributes to the cancellation and closure of coal mines and lignite plants in Turkey. To unpack this finding, uh, I tease out four things. So first, the coal-related whether uh, what are the coal-related injustices that are specific in my case study, whether these struggles um, engender protests, whether they have an impact on coal mines and plants, and if so, whether these are one-off occurrences or whether they have a systemic impact. But first, coal investments reinforce a wide range of injustices. I think this quote again captures really well what I try to put forward in this empirical chapter that I explored how the user rights, access to natural resources uh, play out in the coal affected areas and the extent to which the land, uh, the land users are excluded in the decision making. You wake up one morning and see the company put a fence around your land and security guard to protect your land from you. Uh, I dedicate a chapter to explore the coal related injustices, uh, in my case study, who's experiencing them and how these injustices are connected. So my analysis shows the most prevalent injustices are threefold, disruption of livelihoods, aggravation of public health, and poor working conditions. And these injustices are primarily experienced by the Kurds, the ethnic minority, the Alevis, the uh, religious minority, women, and refugees. Therefore, the constituencies were already vulnerable in terms of exclusion from decision-making. And you see here uh, the interrelation of uh, injustices of all. Well manifested again in employment, um, exclusion from decision-making and health. Uh, these are provided on the very right. And these links between the injustices experienced by the workers and communities show how they are connected in three ways. First, the more the reliance on coal, 
the fewer job prospects beyond the, uh, the coal sector due to disruption of traditional uh, production, change in ownership and access and use of uh, natural resources. Second, uh, both the workers and communities suffer from poor health since mining and combustion exacerbates air, soil, and uh, water uh, pollution as widely known. Third, both constituencies are excluded from decision-making process, although in different ways. The political representation of workers in the coal sector is low and shrinking in Turkey, especially in the last two decades due to subcontractor model of um, employment in the coal sector, disempowerment of the independent unions in Turkey, and the rise of so-called yellow unions, these business-initiated um, trade union structure. And uh, on the other hand, the local communities suffer from uh, involuntary migration, from displacement as a result of the expropriation uh, due to opening new mines and constructing new plants. And they struggle to influence these decisions that concern their lives. Uh, we published these coal-related injustices in the conference proceedings book of the Environmental and Climate Justice Conference. So let's move forward with the second argument, which is the coal-related injustices and gender protests against the ruling party and the incumbent companies. There is a strong and impactful presence of multi-stakeholder and bottom-up opposition groups in almost every uh, project site of uh, Turkey, as you can see from these maps I received from the Ijolt project. And the third argument is that um, local resource users' protests harm the legitimacy of the ruling party and the reputation of the companies. These have repercussions on the electoral return and the commercial return. As a result, many investments fail to materialize and protests disrupt the uh, legitimacy of the iconic projects by amplifying the impact of recurring market-related dynamics that would favor uh, coal phase out. Moreover, they create fissures in the social license of the incumbent companies with strong ties to the ruling party known as the mob of five uh, in Turkey. Let's pause here for a second and unpack what this means. Don't be overwhelmed, I'll go step by step. So I show the coal related harms, their commercial, electoral and reputational risks, and uh, the, uh, their influence on the closure or cancellation uh, decisions in this table. Um, so firstly, the empirical evidence of my thesis suggests that the social unrest associated with the loss of traditional uh, income has influenced companies and government's cancellation decisions. Communities, non-compliance, disobedience, and litigation, which I, uh, for the sake of simplicity, say as protests, um, jeopardize the ruling party's reputation by affecting local endorsement of these uh, projects. They also force the companies to uh, withdraw from projects due to increasing the uh, construction-related expenditures, um, such as delaying um, the obtaining of the construction permits, which often resulted in unviable costs for them to commence the construction. Is my mic? Oops. I think yeah, it should be good. So minimizing the harms of workers' uh, precarious conditions and increasing the occupational uh, safety standards in the coal sector also propose significant commercial risks, um, both, again, to the coal companies and the ruling party, such as increasing the operational costs and thus uh, triggering the early retirement of the existing plants. Uh, and finally, protests that are uh, grounded in minimizing the health harms of the local communities contribute to selling plants and uh, mines. While I was collecting data back in uh, 2020, six coal plants uh, totaling 1.2 gigawatt of installed capacity uh, quite suddenly and temporarily closed uh, due to the protest on health arts. The rehabilitation of infrastructure to comply with the air quality regulation, which was finally uh, started to be enforced in 2020, meant a significant increase in their operating costs, such as retrofitting the filtering systems, constructing stack gas treatment system, building ash ponds, and many things. So they forced many of the privately owned and public utilities to cease their operations before reaching uh, the end of their economic lives. I'm <coughs> conscious of time. Thank you. 
<laughs> well, just um, touch upon the Gers example. So what happened there? Uh, the rural community there, it will come back, don't worry, uh, <laughs> who's primarily reliant on uh, cattle rearing and fishing in the town of Yaiko, uh, my voice has gone on uh, which is located in the Black Sea region in Sinop in Turkey, initiated a multi-stakeholder platform called uh, Yeshil Gerzi platform. It comprises of 49 organizations from many groups, green groups, um, chambers, municipality, local government, and political parties. Uh, the coal company's reputation, the Anadolu Group's reputation, was under attack for many years, for six years, um, from a significant number of villagers, approximately 10,000 uh, during the six time period. And they used numerous strategies, um, such as confrontational and conventional methods, including lawsuits, consumer campaigns, and civil disobedience. Um, so what was the result? Anadolu Group uh, cancelled the project in 2015, and their decision was driven uh, by the delay in the permit process caused by the local communities taking them uh, to court, and they cited it's bad. Funny enough. <laughs> so they cited the potential harm of the plant to the traditional income generation method and litigation was significant in delaying the uh, production permit for six years. So far, so good. But uh, Aisha's story is not a happily ever after uh, story after all. Protests tend to result in uh, episodic ways. Yet, uh, yes, they contribute to halting new plants. They prevent lifetime extensions. Yes, they seize the operations of some existing plants. But they have uh, significant shortcomings in advancing the well-being of workers in the coal sector. And also their impact is meager in terms of a systemic coal phase out at a uh, national level. Which brings me to my uh, next sub-argument. That is, um, while um, it's reasonable to argue that a transition away from coal is currently unfolding and delivering positive justice out outcomes for local communities such as Aisha, um, it has significant shortcomings in advancing the well-being of coal workers. They, these protests, success in eliminating the precarity uh, of coal investment is then becomes questionable because workers' conditions are not improved. And what is more, these protests adversely impact their existing conditions. Uh, to exemplify back again the ad hoc closure decisions, they resulted in various predicaments for the workers in terms of their economic and social well-being. Uh, and this transition phenomena failed to address the fundamental principles that is championed by the idea of just transition in that sense. As such, <coughs> the closure and cancellation uh, decision benefits the agrarian land users while failing to minimize the harm experienced by workers. In summary, a coal transition is unfolding, whereas a just transition currently seems far less likely in my case study. Now, the contentious and non-institutional forms of political participation, which again I uh, brief as a protest, can be a promising factor in spurring a transition while simultaneously increasing the harms reinforced by coal investment. In this slide, I show how the injustices are likely to produce a desired uh, outcome, a normative resistance-led transition uh, category. And you see the motivations for protesting against uh, coal on the left and empirical evidence of my thesis suggests um, that the land-based struggles are often organized based on the injustices experienced in the livelihoods, the health harms, but not the health and safety con conditions of uh, workers in the coal industry. And in the middle, I show the likelihood of success and failure of these projects in terms of halting coal plants or um, teasing the operations of existing plants. And on the very right, you see the obstacles for achieving a systemic change that delivers favorable social and just, uh, social justice and uh, decarbonization outcomes for, both, for all. So this helps me provide a narrative representation of the connections between empirical evidence and the desired systemic change. So what does this table say? First, I suggest protests grounded in disruption of the livelihoods are more likely to halt a plant or mine if traditional income generation is still intact. Another factor that impacts the likelihood of success is the population groups and stakeholders who are being impacted. Um, so protests are generally more likely to deliver positive results if the ruling party's constituency is also affected. 
thirds, the likelihoods of success increase if the impacted um, resource users build alliance with other po politically influential communities, such as advocacy groups working on public health or green groups. Uh, what con factors constrain this systemic change then? The underlying reasons for the failure of protests to become a sustained dynamic that improves the longstanding uh, injustices can be understood in terms of the systemic barriers that constrain the potential of protest in leveraging a uh, just transition. Uh, I note here two predominant limitations, which are the siloing of support and uh, political marginalization. So the land-based struggles, the trade union move, movement and the human rights movement are frequently working in silo because of many reasons, because of their different agendas, different priorities, and different stakeholders they represent. Thus, this unfolding transition phenomena in Turkey, a transition away from coal, despite the political will to transition towards coal, presents a complicated challenge for widespread endorsement, primarily uh, by the workers in the coal sector. The second and the more challenging reason for the difficulty in achieving a just transition is uh, the entrenched political marginalization. The people who bear the brunt of coal investment have the least political standing, with quite limited institutional representation. To exemplify the locally affected users, more specifically the women, the Kurds, refugees, and Alevis, are the most alienated from decision-making in Turkey. Similarly, workers in the coal sector have very limited uh, and diminishing political representation. Uh, this is quite opposite of the politically influential coal worker profile that we know in countries like Australia or countries that have a coal phase out agenda. The idea of resistance led transition is then grounded in the agency of communities um, to contest coal investment as those suffering from uh, the coal infrastructure. And this challenge renders questionable to the potential of the least um, recognized to spur change. And how affected communities assist the just transition away from coal depends on their leverage within the broader political economic setting in which they're uh, embedded. Uh, at this part of the presentation, I will come back to Aisha and Hans and touch upon how my thesis elaborates the idea of just transition by articulating the livelihood concerns, the motive, of the locally affected resource users, the actor, uh, manifested in the protests, the means, in, in a case study that aims to increase its call capacity, the context. So my thesis, brings an added value to sustainability transitions research in terms of articulating Aisha's village to the discussion and have broader implications for other uh, industrializing countries where the government or markets fail to uh, have, a, have the state market configurations to do so. As such, my thesis extends the work of these scholars I noted here um, and elaborate on the political nature of sustainability transitions by articulating the concentration of the call, uh, context that is transitioning towards Second, complementary to the well of workers, companies, and regions with significant political recognition, the idea of resistance-led transition focuses on the already victimized and disenfranchised communities in the existing coal reliant regime, exemplified as Aisha here. As such, my thesis extend the work of scholars who focus on the role of progressive labor uh, moment in addressing the worker rights by incorporating the idea of environmentalism of the poor. Uh, third, my thesis articulates motivations of the locally affected resource users that include economic concerns beyond formal employment, uh, such as concerns regarding informal economy, lower levels of social protection, uh, larger agricultural sector, and maybe most importantly, a greater need to create or stimulate jobs rather than uh, recuperate. Uh, employment in the coal sector. So these concerns extend the fixation of this um, idea to recuperation of formal jobs and creates new channels for political uh, leverage. In that sense, my thesis extends the motive of key transition stakeholders that are considered in the managerial reform and structural reform uh, approaches. Finally, uh, the idea of resistance led transition is built on the disruptive impact of disenfranchised communities with the least political standing on the powerful actors who govern the market or control the technology or enable the financing. And in this example, I just break it to the uh, local uh, police. Board. So my thesis extends the typology of uh, my personal favorite schools uh, regarding the state-led, market-led, technology-led or community-led uh, pathways to 
sustainable uh, transitions. To wrap up, my thesis extends the idea of just transition by articulating the improvement of longstanding injustices to the frequently asserted considerations on minimizing those of uh, climate check, uh, action on jobs, on economic assets, while maximizing the sustainability outcomes in health, in the environment, and on uh, livelihoods. In other words, my thesis complements the justice challenges associated with the transition away from coal, alas, Hans's concerns, with the plight reinforced by coal investment. Aisha then represents the missing component in the just transition story, for whom we aim for justice. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Sharon. Uh, we have 20 minutes, just over 20 minutes for questions. Uh, and we have um, yeah, a great audience. So look forward to hearing your questions and for Sharon to respond. I'm going to start at the back over here and then I'll turn it over. No, 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 no. Supervisors have plenty of opportunity. <laughs> this, is, this, this is the opportunity for a broader well, audience. Firstly, thank you for your presentation today. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on the last point you made. You briefly touched on this typology between market led, state led, community led <laughs> research. Could you just maybe elaborate a bit because I'm not going to be Sure, with pleasure. Um, and so this is this. Um, ideal types are, uh, and the idea of pathways is developed by Ian Schoons in this um, article called The Politics of Sustainability and Development. And then he later elaborates this pathways approach with uh, Melissa Leach, Peter Newell, uh, Andrew Sterling, which are all uh, quite uh, front and center of this thesis. So it mainly talks about four ideal types, uh, the state-led, market-led, community-led, and technology-led. Um, these are to uncover the patterns and processes uh, for a sustainability transition uh, to occur and also not to their uh, political nature. Maybe before I elaborate on the four of them, it's I think important to note two things. One is that these ideal types are never found in their fully, uh, full forms. In, in it. So we cannot talk about a transition that is fully state-led or fully market-led. Um, and the second one um, is that this is a, an interplay of uh, motivation. So they, they don't operate in isolation. So what is a state-led uh, transition? It's where the governments provide supply or demand side uh, policies. They use regulations, incentives, or disincentives to um, regulate the market. For example, the Spanish or German uh, examples fit into the uh, state-led uh, coal transition uh, category. The market-led transition ideal type is where the markets are the principal mechanism that uh, triggers uh, the acceleration, such as the USA uh, or UK uh, types. Maybe to give a bit of context, um, last decade in US, there's a big shale gas uh, development, which then triggers uh, around 200 gigawatt of existing coal plants to retire. It's big, it's a huge development that is uh, not solely, but primarily driven by uh, the market favoring uh, shale gas. Um, and UK is another example for uh, the market case for domestic uh, natural resources. So the third one is a technological, uh, technologically led uh, transition. It's more on the silver bullet technologies, R&D, uh, technology transfer, commercialization of uh, research type of um, pathway. And finally, the community-led one, which I believe the resistance-led transition puts a nuance into this fourth category, is grounded in the citizen engagement. Uh, through It can be through community energy initiatives, grassroots innovation, such as the energy transitions we are seeing in uh, Denmark or more uh, where the communal um, innovations are more decisive. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so how is this playing out in Southeast Asia, which in, in their context is they're developing and also it's moved to the transition? Yeah. Are they 
by the state, by the community, by the market, or is the resistance and movement also driving a lot of that? Mm. Uh, again, a great tough question. Uh, thank you. Um, so, in fact, we published something uh, about this with the two uh, other co authors sitting here from uh, Monash today. So, as I said, it's hard to categorize a transition phenomena into what? No, it's an interplay of all. But I think for the Vietnamese and Indonesia cases, it is safe to put them in a stateless state transition uh, category where there's a high level political will from the Indonesian and Vietnamese government to provide a net zero uh, target by 2050 and then uh, provides just uh, and then to um, just energy transition partnerships with, with the global north to uh, accelerate uh, this transition to enable the financing uh, to do so. Having said that, it is of course not 100% safe to say a transition with uh, wholeheartedly because in Indonesia we see some tweaks uh, about um, the coal mines, it's about a specific uh, coal plant uh, infrastructure that is mentioned to be seized out. In Vietnam, we see in PDP8 the latest development um, uh, strategy that some uh, that still foresees a generation of coal plants. So I think it's a very, very important uh, example, the Vietnam and Indonesia ones, that will also uh, be impact the fate of other industrializing countries who choose to pull, move forward with these partners country-led uh, initiatives <coughs> that is backed up by uh, the global north, but I would say it's more state-led. Which state is another question. Thanks, um, great presentation. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a question about land. Um, in your presentation and, and in some of the work you've done, you spend um, you talk a lot about labor and livelihoods. And in a way, you're making the important point that these global concerns around decarbonization manifest locally. And when they materialize locally, they they um, they pit. Um, la sometimes labor and capital are on the same side of not wanting to close, but once closure is on the cards, um, you, you have that old tension between labor and capital and who are the winners and who are the losers, right? Um, so, but with your case study, I felt like what is happening to Aisha is actually yet another round of enclosure of land. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, what you're seeing is interests around ownership and control of land at a very local scale playing out, like materializing and in conflict um, as well. So I feel like you have something really interesting to say about, um, in contrast to the focus, the dominant focus on labor and capital, you're really bringing land into the, into the mix. And there's actually a potential alliance between land interests and labor interests that is to do with spatial proximity. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you could talk a bit more about the importance of land um, to Aisha and to some of these local activists um, and how it makes sense in terms of your broader conclusions. Right. Uh, thank you for, for the great question. I think it also provides me an opportunity to share why I specifically um, why my thesis is grounded in the political ecology framework rather than a labor environmentalism framework, which you would assume so. No, if you're talking about the just transition, the literature that you would conventionally rely on would be the um, labor environmentalism uh, literature. So, which I primarily intended to, but then my uh, research brought me this um, interconnections between land and labor and the analytical um, framework of ecological distribution conflict, which exactly is materialized what you uh, mentioned. So I think that is 
uh, you captured it really well. I wish I, it's actually on the record that I can spice up my uh, conclusion. Uh, that it is exactly about that. Aisha is not a conventional actor in uh, sustainability transitions research. And I think what is the, what I enjoyed in articulating this is exactly this political ecology knowledge, uh, know-how and uh, disclosure, uh, the enclosure of her land and her uh, response to the socio-environmental disruption that could actually bring justice and uh, decarbonization outcomes. I think you could probably bring that out of <laughs> the like livelihoods, environmentalism to the fore. Mm -hmm. um, you could emphasize a bit more the importance of this being a potential alliance of um, land, you know, the business peasants mm -hmm. or um, local land users and owners with labor. Right. Okay, good to note. And I think it also, if I may take yeah, yeah. Uh, another 30 seconds to uh, elaborate on that. The, uh, in fact, the primary, the first, um, so the first uh, labor environmentalism focus in the just transition debate in the early 70s in US actually has this um, taste in it. It's, what it says is to bring the pan-slide communities and frontline workers. But during this, when we approach uh, towards the contemporary time, the, with the formal endorsement of the rhetoric in the UN and mainstreaming of this idea in climate negotiation, I think that this popularization moves into something else and this, uh, this connection is lost. And I think, not lost, sorry, I, I, sh I shouldn't overstate. Uh, what's happening, but uh, it doesn't have the big focus on the actually the interlinkages of the pan-slide communities and frontline workers, which I think the political ecology literature helps me to uh, refine this nuance, uh, which is materializing in Aisha's uh, words. We can just, and I'm not sure we've got one more question here, but the other tension that perhaps you didn't bring out is the tension between the marginalised workers in the coal industry and the subsistence, those who already have access to land. So marginalisation cuts unequally, mm -hmm. as I understand it from your research, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that, that the marginalisation of, of the Kurds and Alibi sometimes is much more in that um, uh, subsistence use of coal the sort of um, gathering of coal. And so it's fractured again at the land level within the marginalised populations themselves. Absolutely. Um, to exemplify that, Sunni men in mid Anatolia is not affecting, affected in the extent that a Kurdish female is being affected in, um, yeah. in the eastern part of Turkey. There, it has some... A very interesting environmental justice uh, elements to it that we tried to tease out in the thesis, but I didn't have the time to tease out here. Yeah. So I think there was a question here, and then we'll go to the screen. Oh, one online. Okay, great. Jan, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question, I guess, taking it away from the world life scale. Do you think? The international climate regime towards coal phase out is having an impact on mainstreaming resistance in a Turkish context um, to early coal closure outside to see localized sites of directly impacted communities, whether that's through different side measures, you know, like carbon border adjustment mechanisms and that's potential implications, or you know things like in the financial sector, insurances and other things. Do you think that's, in this context specifically, mm -hmm. helping to mainstream that resistance across some of those alliances and stakeholders that you're saying are often siloed? Yeah, I'm not sure if I would use the word mainstreaming in that sense, but absolutely complementing. Uh, I think what um, this idea of resistance-led transition uh, brings into this debate is that the resistance uh, provides an opportunity for these international regimes like carbon border adjustment or other market 
um, dynamics of carbon tax that is now unfolding in Turkey and so to gain impact. So it is a combination of all actors. And I think this delay phase of Turkey caught thanks to resistance also allows these um, international, um, what is known as this regime level uh, changes to accelerate a transition away from coal in, in my case study. Thanks, Jaren. Great to see uh, such an accomplished presentation. Um, you've, you've, you've dived into the resistance of marginalized communities and people, um, but there's also the resistance of incumbents. In Australia, for instance, um, it's not so difficult for us to talk about getting off coal fired power generation in this country. What's very, very challenging is for economic communities that are coal dependent governments that are resource revenue dependent on coal to talk about how we stop exporting coal and mm -hmm. pay for those hospitals with that income. As I understand it in Turkey, um, the, it's a net import. So basically all of Turkey's coal goes for domestic power production. My question is, if there's going to be a coal transition, um, you've spoken about how it may be led by resistance at community and marginalised community levels, um, what happens to the economic communities that are called together? What happens to the, with those incumbents that, that have so much stake in the coal game domestically? What replaces all of that? What changes? Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for the uh, great question again. So I think it then comes down to the political economy of coal that I briefly inferred to, but did not have time to go through. So coal dependency has many facets, no? It's the, the reason why uh, the Adani mine is happening or not happening in Australia is very different from what is happening uh, with a plant in, in Turkey. In that sense, um, I briefly tried to mention there the, um, the maintenance of the regime, which plays out very differently uh, in uh, different countries, the state of the abundance of reserves and the export uh, volume of coal in the overall uh, macroeconomic implications of these coal exports are actually uh, playing out more quote positively in Turkey because it's a net importer, because it accounts for almost half of the current account deficit is on energy import. So it is, we are talking about a very different operating in environment and very different incumbents. So the incumbents of the coal sector in Turkey also have very high share of uh, renewable energy um, operations. In that sense, I remember hearing many quotes and many anecdotal evidence that have happened in the back doors that the companies mentioned that they actually want to take it out from this come because it doesn't bring them anything. And the government backs up with other more um, financially favorable terms for them to continue. So it can play out in different ways based on what financial incentives are uh, given and so on and so forth. So I think resistance from the incumbent companies would also play out based on uh, the political ec economy of coal reliance in that specific uh, context. Online question from Anthony. Fantastic presentation. I agree. And congratulations on your thesis. Could you see your findings and the RLT being used to stop or wind back other forms of land, misconception and disruption, or are these specific to fossil fuel developments? Could this be used to stop renewable energy projects that require use of local land? Hmm. Uh, great question again. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Um, so I, in fact, uh, in the further research part, I suggested that this RLT uh, idea could also be tested for uh, renewable energy projects. It's not specifically for uh, fossil fuel projects and for any sustainability uh, transition. Uh, it can be, uh, I guess, tailored uh, and accommodated. Um, in fact, we are seeing many um, developments against renewable energy projects in Turkey 
uh, on the, especially on the Western coast, and especially targeting the same utilities, the mobile five, as I uh, mentioned, uh, to simplify it, that developed this huge utility scale wind projects that are booming in west uh, in Western uh, Turkey. So yes, this this resistant flood, I, I don't know if it would lead into a transition or cancellation decisions, but I think it's also worth um, tailoring uh, this idea in uh, future uh, research. Thank you. We've got time for one more. Is there any questions? Yeah, please. Okay, well, will you join with me in thanking Sharon very much? Thank you very much. I choked but survived. <laughs> Thanks everyone who joined online. I know it's quite early in Turkey, so I appreciate it. <laughs>